Welcome everybody, thank you so much for joining me tonight on Guitar Night Live. I'm Daniel Jacobson at Ultimate School of Music. We do this Guitar Night Live every Saturday night, eight o'clock GMT. It's quite a few international people joining from different places tonight, so it's always at 8 p.m. GMT. Every week I have a different guest who um, is a guitar player of all different genres from different areas of the guitar world and really excited about tonight's guest who is a guitarist from Dublin originally who moved over to New York in the 80s. He's a jazz musician who has played with some of the greats in jazz music and arranged and composed and worked with some incredible people. So really looking forward to hearing some stories about that and how he got to where he is now and lots of guitar stuff too guitar playing approach to guitar practice picking all that good stuff my guest tonight is david o'rourke hello david welcome hi daniel hello everybody out there how you doing so david one thing which is interesting is that you do a lot of live stream things a little bit like this where you talk to other musicians and is that on every single day do you do that every day every day yeah <laughs> seven days a week seven days a week um i i didn't plan to do it but kind of slid into it and uh, paul dunley the trombone player from cork uh, kind of encouraged me that there was a community forming and that if i found myself being the initially the center figure of that i should go with the flow and uh, that's what i've done and it's kind of got a life of its own now when, when did you start doing that um i think as soon as Honestly, date-wise, I could trace it back by li Facebook Live, the first live video I posted. Uh, but I did a workshop the first day, just using the, I, not using Zoom, just the Facebook Live feature. Yeah. And uh, I, I planned on only doing just one, just to throw something out to the community. And, uh, and uh, then it was the next day, and we've been doing it ever since. So I, I think it was, was that, the day after St. Patrick's Day, maybe, or something like that. It was it was March 18th, maybe, I think. Six weeks or more. Yeah. yeah. Two months nearly. Great. And uh, so with the with the live stream things, I was going to ask you, do you think it seems like talking is almost becoming like the next music? Like there's so many podcasts. People seem to love listening to people talking about music. It's like becoming more and more popular. I have a kind of a little suspicion why that might be. We've um, technology has pushed us away in the direction where people don't pick up their phones and talk to one another anymore. And when I was growing up, it was very expensive to call home from here to my mother and father. So I could I had to plan on one call a week. And when when my dad died, I used to kind of my mom would be waiting for that call and she was living alone and and she would say, well, that's it now. I won't hear from you. You know, I'll have to wait till next week. So I used to try and surprise her with a midweek call. And when phone cards came in, that made it possible. But prior to that, it was really, it was expensive. It was, I was making not a lot of money. I wasn't here that long and teaching. Uh, it was taking a good chunk out of my, my weekly wage just to call home. So you had a kind of a sense of value. Uh, you know, a sense of value on this. And I felt that um, when text became the thing, people stopped calling and they almost didn't want you to talk. And now we've gone the other way. They've forgotten what it's like to have something that we Irish do very well, which is uh, have conversations with one another. We're storytellers and stuff like that. So I, I think people are finding that not only is it informative, but it's also, you know, it's personal. Yeah, totally, totally agree. A couple of comments come in already. Uh, Nicholas was saying people enjoy stories and insight and intimate quality to the music. And uh, Andy said one of the most interesting aspects of David's daily broadcasts is the variety of players and talents that he secures. His guests share openly about music and their different paths. Very true. It's a really, really interesting array of guests you've got on. Yeah, some of it initially would have been coming from my own contacts, but now uh, the likes of Stephen Kyo, Dublin-born drummer who lives in Valencia in Spain, 
he'll call me and uh, even tonight there's a guitar player I've never heard of going to jump in along with Scott Flanagan and they don't know that yet unless they're listening to this now but we have drop-in guests like that which I love because I know nothing about them and I'm learning so Stephen's responsible for guests John Daly is responsible uh, from Limerick he's been helping me uh, just uh, put the schedule together and there's another gentleman Chris Taberge who is a producer he was involved in Phil Collins uh I'm not dead yet tour. I think it was called. It's a great name for an album or tour. Uh, his kids are in the youth band that I run, and right. So that's how we sk- we get a few of the people. You know, it's not just me. Brilliant. Any anybody watching this straight after this is over, tune into David's show tonight with uh, the drummer Steve Davis and a couple other Scott, Scott Flanagan is going on. Yeah. Well, David, why don't you wanted to ask you about how you got into playing guitar originally. How did you start? I'm the youngest of four boys. Um, my second oldest brother, Michael, was in a was in a rock band uh, back in the '60s, and he played the blues. And he was he had a magnificent pair of ears. I sometimes think, no matter how good my ears might be, I've a memory of him learning off all these traffic Steve Winwood stuff on the piano without having played the piano before and he he had great he just seemed to have a natural ear and I never saw him pulling the needle back at connection with his brain and memory and and I used to think he's the guy that really had the talent he just didn't get the opportunity to develop it or maybe life didn't present it to him in the way it did for me but he showed me first three chords that I I ever learned and I remember about a week later he heard me playing about 20 something songs with those three chords. And, and he said, who showed you that? And I go, you showed me the chords. He goes, but those songs, he was very impressed that I'd gone and figured out some other songs. What you age know. were you then at that point? Uh, nine or 10, cause I'd started piano at nine. And it's, it's important to say with full disclosure that when my mother heard me picking out a melody with one finger at the piano, she said, would you like to learn? I said, yeah, I'd love to. And I thought that meant show up once a week and somebody would show you. And that was it. This practice thing, it was getting in the way of my, I was going to be the next George Best, except my feet had different ideas. <laughs> I, I loved football, as it, you know, and, uh, but in those days, it, it almost doesn't matter whether you're good or not at it. You still love it. And the first day I had to miss a football game because my mother figured out I hadn't practiced was, I remember, I, I, contemplated just this music thing is not is not what I want to do if I'm if I got to miss football over it you know wow and, then, and I was no good at it I have to emphasize you know <laughs> so what kind of music did you like as you were growing up when you were a teenager or did you what time what stage did you get into jazz jazz came a bit later although I heard it when I was very young um It's interesting because I had three older siblings, as I mentioned, and they were all into different things musically. And then my father was, um, my father was a very interesting man because uh, we didn't have much money. He he was recovering from alcoholism. Uh, He'd sobered up by the time I was seven. And not long after, you know, we had a baby grand piano and uh, a state-of-the-art hi-fi system and little else. Like he, the priorities were, were really, uh, they, they worked out great for me. But his love of music, all types, classical, jazz, and he played me a lot of, like in one sitting, he, I remember him playing me a movement of a Mozart piano concerto and Mahalia Jackson singing gospel, Precious Lord, um, and um, the con- Earl Garner's Concert by the Sea, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, Bob Dylan's freewheeling album. So there was a lot, a huge range of, and he pointed out Louis Stewart to me years later on the TV. Then my brothers were, Andrew, next oldest brother, would have been the folk guy. So I got a love of Donovan and Dylan and, you know, all the, I, I remember when I heard Dylan, I we couldn't get a harmonica holder. So I had a coat hanger cutting me the back of the neck with sellotape holding uh, the harmonica on it. And it would fall off in the middle of one of the aggressive wah-wah <laughs> sounds that I'd make. And then uh, Michael, who showed me the chords, he was the Beatles guy. And uh, Paul, my oldest brother, was the Rolling Stones. And, you know, so 
everything, I heard everything and, and, and appreciated everything. When I got into jazz years later, it was as a result of my father playing, someone pointing out Louis Stewart on the TV. And it got to the point, actually, that I remember, uh, I found out afterwards that when my brother would hear me putting the key in the door, uh, he'd say, quickly, <laughs> put on the TV before he plays a record. Because we had a kind of one room scenario where the stereo on the and uh, uh, hi-fi was. I wanted to play Wes Montgomery. And, and for years, I wondered why my next oldest brother was watching the Magic Roundabout when I arrived home. <laughs> and did, at what point did you start to play gigs? Play gigs? Um, I think the first gig I ever played wasn't a jazz gig. It was with, there was a, a friend of mine. Actually, I'm pretty certain this, apart from school, uh, playing in the, there was no school band, but they used to have, do you remember they had these folk masses where they take some pop song and, and change the lyrics to a prayer and uh, then let it be, they, Mother Mary kind of got that one in the door. And I just have a memory of correcting the changes on the, the, uh, the music teacher in school. And because I, even back then, I couldn't stand wrong harmony and and I remember he would go then in front of the whole class, he'd play the next chord. Is that okay with you, Mr. O'Rourke? And he, he, wasn't, he, wa he wasn't terribly happy with me. But uh, actual gig where I got paid, Malahide United Soccer Club asked me and two guys, could we put something together for a half an hour? And uh, there was me and a guy called Brenny Mahan. And who was, I can't remember the third guy, another Malahide local. And it was a mixture of what we could all play to fill up a half hour. Malahide, where you grew up? That's where I grew up, yeah. And uh, did you go to, uh, did you start going to sea gigs? Hugh's on now, Hugh Buckley's joined us. How are you, Hugh? This is your fault I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm used to asking questions. <laughs> yeah, and everybody, if anybody has any questions for David, just shoot them either. You can raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can ask, or you can ask a question in the chat or the Q&A box. So there's loads of ways. So what, what, when did you meet Hugh? Um, Hugh, I would have met, I think, we were trying to figure this out the other day. Actually, we were talking about it and it, it could be one of a few different scenarios. The Parliament Inn when his uncle was playing, or I think when his uncle Dick was playing there, or Richie and Dick might have told me about him when I was, part of my learning process was stalking Louis Stewart showing up unannounced at his house and I would arrive on a Friday and leave on a Sunday night or, you know, I ended up staying there. It's, it's, you'd be arrested for the stuff I got away with. <laughs> but prior to that, I would go meet Richie in, um, in his house while he was waiting on, he was in one of the last of the show bands, Carol and the New Blues. And while he was waiting in the van to pick him up, I would comp chords for him while on standards, whatever I was, starting to learn the few I could play while he he would solo and then the next thing the van's here Richie you have to go and as soon as that would finish Pam his mother would make some of the first curries I ever had period that I remember eating and then I'd be around to Louis Stewart's by about four o'clock just show up no invitation knock on the door brought in and made welcome as if I'd been invited wow that's incredible and did did Louis show you stuff on the guitar like not a thing he wouldn't show me uh, i even went to the point of trying to stage an intervention on that i brought a cassette recorder with the phrase i wanted him to show me i said maybe now if i play him what it is i want he's going to know that he played it and and i said to him uh, now listen to this and it was baba do that out and do that out and do that out. and i i couldn't hear it. i knew there was some logic to it and i said what's that and in a very kind of, you know, don't ask me this question ever again, look on his face, he said, he said, oh, I don't know, some triplet thing. <laughs> but what he did do was he played records of other people that inspired him and explained what he liked about the solo or what, or, and kind of taught me jazz, appre music appreciation, jazz style, while it was quite clear a lot of people of his generation we're not comfortable in the idea of showing you something that uh, there was a feeling among some people that they were harming you by making it that easy for you. You needed to 
maybe transcribe it yourself or i heard this about louis that like when i was in college this was kind of the legend if you will that like louis learned by transcribing every wes montgomery record he could get and that's how he learned to play you're frozen there on my screen can you hear me oh we have internet glitch they'll probably come back if you guys can still hear me yeah Absolutely. see you there now yeah Okay, so I was just saying there, the legend was Louis learned by transcribing Wes Montgomery, every record he could get his hands on. And that's how he learned to play. He didn't like get lessons with anyone or, is that true? Do you he know? was, yeah, he was, um, he was mainly self-taught. Look, um, with somebody like Louis, first of all, I want to make very clear in case I had to tell truthfully an answer to your question. He didn't really sit down and show me anything, but he was very helpful to me in other ways. He would have me depth for him when, uh, when I really wasn't ready to do that. And can you imagine how that good that was for your self-esteem? Jeez, Louis Stewart wants me to play for him. Now, I never got the call from him. Betty would call his wife because the first time I got the call was the first time you got the call was for the five guitars years later. Oh. And Louis on, the, Louis on the other end of the phone calling us all, it was very unusual. But he listened to Barney Kessel and all the greats, Tal Farlow and and would have transcribed or picked up bits. Sometimes too, he just picked up from, you know, casual listening too. You know, it's not necessarily transcribing the whole thing. You hear it and and you get the overall vibe of it as your ears open up, I guess, you know, and he had remarkable ears. Uh, could, could I ask you if, could you play examples of things you picked up from Louis or? Um, yeah, I'll try and, try and remember now some that, um, I would have probably initially early on, I was trying to play stuff that I would have seen him do, but I also figured that I was going to have to get my own thing, whatever that was very early on. So I started to uh, more steal from other players <laughs> besides yeah. him, but I, people who I knew influenced him. But yeah, I'll, um, I'll see if I can. Um... So people, a few people joined us. Hi, like Damien's here and uh, Cassandra Wilson. We're honored Cassandra Wilson's here. Great singer. She knows all my licks. <laughs> <laughs> so from Louis, what would have been, um, there's... Can you pull the mic over a bit towards you? Please? Yeah. Thanks, great. Um, I suppose uh, one of the things that I might remember from him was, uh, say, Darn That Dream. I remember. That's a bit loud, right? No. definitely from him I would have got that from him if the rest wasn't you know kind of uh, very transcribed and a blues he used to play a lot to warm up was um, bluesology I think the it's on this for it's Did you go to lessons with anyone or were you just were you transcribing stuff and asking Louis? Um, I'll tell you what I heard quite a lot from people was, uh, oh man, it's too bad you took this up now. Louis used to teach in Capel, Capel Street. I kept hearing about where in Capel Street is he still there? No, no, he stopped. He got he got tired. He didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, and then, well, who did he teach? And I'd hear about Jerry Lynch and Tommy Hafferty and. Tommy wasn't really teaching because he was busy with his own. He he had a school teacher gig and he agreed to see me. Uh, but again, it turned out to be just a talk through session. He, uh, I remember the same thing. He played something that sounded like a Joe Pass riff. And I said, what, what was that? And it's like, now nah, stop. What was that? And he goes, 
or some flat fire thing. <laughs> uh, but again, he, you know, it was late at night and he was, you know, probably not dialed mm -hmm. in. There, there was no culture of people teaching. Yeah. And finally, a classical guitar player called, um, oh, he passed away tragically. Uh, he was, uh, I feel embarrassed. He, he was teaching in the same practice as Alan Grundy, who um, had taken lessons with Louis. And he said, maybe if you talk to him, he could, he could do it. So I booked a month's lessons with him and he made it clear he wasn't a jazz guitar player, but he, he went out of his way to remember. He brought in all the notes Louis had given to him, copied them for me and tried to remember what some of them were about. And I remember initially going, what was this again? Ah, okay. And he, he very kindly showed me. It was enough to get me in the front door, if you like. Yeah. So at what point did you feel that you're going to move to New York? How did that happen? Um, Ooh, that's um, I'm trying to remember when that actual mindset happened. Um, I think at some point, you know, we used to read the back of vinyl album covers, and I do remember um, like a watershed moment for me was um, playing along with on my father's reel to reel recorder with George Benson playing a thing called Bossa Rocca. I can't even remember how it goes. I'd learned the solo. And I'm reading the back of the album cover and I'm reading about Count Basie's club and playing with Jack McDuff. And, and I remember thinking, I'll never be able to play the way I want to play unless I'm up there in Harlem playing, not even knowing there was a scene like that anymore, playing with those guys because um, it's the only way I'm going to, if, if I'm going to live this life and I have to do what they did. And, you know... Years later, I did get to do that, and uh, it, it did, I feel it helped me. But I was offered sponsorship by Aer Lingus to go once a week to study in London. And typical of me, my response was, uh, does it have to be London? Can I go to New York? And there was a big price difference between the plane tickets. And they said, let us come back to you on that. They ended up giving me three or four round trip tickets to New York. Uh, Three, maybe, three, which was changed everything for me. So when you're, I read that your mum had rang up Bucky Pizzarelli. How did, is that true? No, no, uh, she didn't. Um, um, Louis actually, Dave Fleming had said to me that, you know, Louis had gotten a bit tired of people just using his contacts. People would show up at Ronnie Scott's. And so when I was going to New York, I decided I'm not going to ask him because he's, I've always been kind of sensitive to that. Like people, even with George Benson, I wouldn't ask him for, because uh, all people seem to do is ask him to do something. Will you do this for me, George? Will you? So I, um, with Louis, I didn't ask him. And a week before I left for New York, he said, do you want some phone numbers? I, and he gave me Bucky Pizzarelli's number. And through, through that, I think this is where you got the thing about my mom. Um, you, uh, after I came back, uh, they went over on a visit and they met up with Bucky's manager, Dick Abels, who was very kind to me. He'd become a personal friend, an older man. He was uh, Louis Belson's manager and Pearl Bailey's manager. Um, and he just uh, took me under his wing when I arrived. So my mom... Uh, I remember her asking him, they went to lunch together, my mom and my dad and him. And my aunt just was very negative, kept saying, tell him to stay home, musicians are a dime a dozen over here. And she was also very racist and she was aware that I was hanging out with African-American musicians and this was, you know, uh, this didn't fit her plot line at all and her storyline. And my mom never, <laughs> there was great friction between these two relatives their whole life. But my mom was affected by what she said and asked Dick Abels, uh, how will he do over here? My, my sister see, said to me, the place is crawling with musicians. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, there's a lot of musicians, all right, but there's always room for one more good one, he said to my mom. Right. And that Little things like that were kind of like a, a lift to me. Wow, that's 
brilliant. There's so many stories I know you have. I don't want to ask you loads about New York, but you've got the guitar in your hands there. So let's let's hear some more about how you formed your approach to the guitar and specifically practicing. Have you, have you got any thoughts about how you approach practicing? Yeah, um, I think like everything else in us humans, uh, hopefully it evolves over over time. I feel when when I was starting out first, I thought I was behind the eight ball, as they say here, and uh, had left it too late. Yeah, you know, this is at 18 or 17 or 18 that I, when I got serious. And you'd read about somebody like Borelli Lagrena, who was hitting it out of the park at 11. And I think, oh, God, I didn't, you know, I'm not I'm not a prodigy of, of you know, music was in my life my whole time. But then I started doing things like practicing scales and exercises for hours and hours. And I used to, when I was working in the B&I line, I used to practice for two hours before I went to work, get up early. And that was really to convince my parents when I did eventually quit my job that I was serious about doing it. And then I'd try and practice when I came home, often fell asleep from exhaustion with uh, listening. But I think in those days, what I was practicing was, because I didn't know any better, wasn't using my time, that I think by the time you learn a fingering of a scale and learn how to move around it pretty well, you have basically served your purpose with that. You know, you know. You're not going to learn a whole lot more by just looping that. Um, but coming up with exercise and trying to keep things fresh. Talked with Paul and Lee about this recently. He said he approaches practice like going to the gym, the way people say, today I'm going to work on my shoulders and my tomorrow. And I certainly like to, uh, I'm a noodler, I think, uh, just to noodle around on the instrument, which is... That lures me into a mood where I want to play something. Uh, I'll play snippets of tunes, not full tunes. Uh, because, you know, when I'm on a gig, if I'm playing with other people, I get inspired by what they're doing. But when I'm on my, my own, uh, I might pick a standard. Or I think a watershed moment for me, too, is when I, I was telling you this the other day, I think that I got a gig playing four hours solo guitar when I had never done anything like that before and told Bucky Pizzarelli about it. And he said, oh, great. And I go, really? Because I thought he was going to sympathize with me for having, and he goes, no, you get your chops together. And I think if I could probably show something that I used to do there, my hands would seize up because I hadn't prepared for that, especially the first few gigs. So if I had a tune that was in B flat, or if it was, if it was in B flat, I'd move it to A if my hands were tired and use the open strings so um, or if it was e flat i'd move it to e you know and then transpose down when the hands felt good so it'd be something like uh <laughs> put a chord that and as there was commerce involved here I was getting fifty dollars for that gig and there was one guy used to come every week if I played watch what happens when he walked in the door I got ten dollars as a tip from him and as he got drunk he wanted to hear it again and uh, and uh, get another 10 bucks out of him. So now on a $50 gig, I've gotten $20 from this guy who's now loudly saying, play, watch what happens, God damn it. And goes, and as I'm playing it, I know that there's money going in the pot. 
as the weeks went by, say something that started out as this became uh, experiment maybe go I, I tried to not play it the same way each time I've got something on my screen here so um, you know I always tried to find new ways to play the same thing and then as I got as I would get the melody down and thinking I'm boring these people to death in the restaurant I, I still had to fill four hours <laughs> with breaks and uh, and I go from something about the way I approach it is I'm always I started out on piano reluctantly when I was younger but I try to you might notice I'll feed a chord and I'm thinking that's my piano player's left hand So and so, it's a. Uh, That's fantastic. Sounds amazing. Are you so, are there any questions coming in? Because I'll ramble on all day. Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Just before I ask you those, for to clarify about what you're saying about m changing the keys to A or E. When when you were playing just there, you were playing it in E flat, right? In the rhythm. Yeah, I moved it into E flat as I got more comfortable with right. it. Uh, the start of it was I could get away with you could um, if I had to figure out a tune if I kind of half knew the melody and there was, you know, I learned that you don't say no if you kind of half know the thing. I'd even say I don't know the I don't know the whole tune, but I play a little bit of it in the middle of a medley, and I uh, hate to put it all about money, but that guy would give you a tip, and with the open string, with thirds, two note chords, and it's not killing my hands. And, you know, of course, if I was smart enough to practice playing this solo style at the time, I might have gotten a bit better. But in between gigs, I wouldn't. I'd, I would just play the, I'd play the normal kind of practice thing that I was doing. <laughs> Thinking, you know, instead of working on what I needed to work on. It sounds like um, a brilliant education having to play tunes for four hours like anyone would benefit a lot from having to do that. And you can't stop. You have to just keep playing. Yeah, because the tunes people were asking for were, you know, you're, you're there playing. The great thing about living in the United States is certainly then people have a an aptitude to the great American songbook. They'll, they'll know Cole Porter or Gershwin and stuff like that. But then you'd have somebody come up and, um, and would want you to play, you know, something from the popular culture. And I'd have a go at that if it was something I knew from back in the days with my with my brother you know and, uh, so if somebody asked me to do you know just I knew that uh, don't think twice it's all right by Bob Dylan I, I maybe wouldn't play it like Dylan would play it but
that's not an arrangement. Um, I'm not saying this for it. Yeah, that's that's the ability to do that, like I did there. That's part of my noodling system in in place. I'm going to go down. There are moments when I'm doing that where I'm going to get the message. The GPS gives you, please turn around as soon as possible. You know, uh, I get harmonic versions of that, and that's part of being a jazz musician. Oh, that's brilliant. Great song. Don't, don't think twice. There's a, quite a few questions coming in, so let's... Uh, There's a really good question from Andy here, who asks, since you teach, in, teach the youth orchestra, youth jazz orchestra in New York, would it it'd be interesting to hear your advice about how you coach young or older players? What's your thoughts about coaching? There's two basic differences between coaching older musicians and younger musicians, particularly ones that would have come from my, my generation. The older ones were already, if, they, if something didn't come easy to them, they were embarrassed. And they would say to you, oh, maybe I left it too long to do this, or maybe, you know, maybe maybe I need to come to my senses and, and you end up having to be, uh, I don't say this in a derogatory way, a psychologist to them because you need to make them believe that they can do, you know, uh, don't beat themselves up over it. They're here to enjoy it and try and find what it is and remind them that I wasn't born uh, when my mother gave birth to me, I didn't go, hey, everybody, C7, flat 9, sharp 11, how you doing? I didn't know any of that stuff. That's acquired knowledge along the way. And um, I think you, my goal as a teacher is to find the door into their way of learning. And usually that's governed by what do they want to learn? I'm not going to turn around and say, go transcribe this off a recording. If they see me doing a lick they want to play, I'll show it to them. With younger ones, um, again, I'm learning as I go along that there's, um, you know, I thought I, I had a pretty good way of teaching down until I took my kid for uh, some soccer coaching. And they were, we were talking the other day, so the Socratic method of teaching where they, um, they're trying to get American people on the sideline instead of going, use your left foot, goddamn, what's the matter with this kid? Jeez, I showed him how to do this. Uh, to turn that around to, um, you know, they give you two choices. Silent observation was the one I loved, where, in other words, shut the F up and let the kid play. Or, what are your options? And the kid, okay, I can either dribble past this guy, I can take a shot, or I can pass the ball. And, and there are several more, probably, uh, that, you know, and the fact is the decision and the improvisational nature of how they responded. So I've been using that with the younger kids, you know. Um, really interesting. Instead of saying, you did this wrong, yeah. you know, say, what could, what could we do better here? Right. Um, stuff like that. So um, it's also with the kids, trying to get them to listen to the music. Because sometimes in our program, I have to fish out who are the kids where the parents thought this would be a good idea to send them here. And the kids really don't want it. If they don't want it, uh, sometimes they change, they get to like what they're hearing. and they. But if they don't really want it, there's not a thing you or I can do to make somebody play a music that has to come through your heart. Absolutely. Another question, Cassandra asked, have you given any jazz guitar arrangements for Shan Nose music? Um, so th Cassandra's probably uh, prompting. She knows that I, I knew the round. I, I write arrangements for all sorts of ensembles and orchestra, but with the guitar, I don't write arrangements for the guitar, but I, in my noodle factory, um, I, what I have done is I'll, I'll take, you know, say some, um, you know, let's see what would um, Sean O'Reilly is. Um, I did um, see if I this would have been a, in its original form, it would have been. I wrote it, or wrote it, not wrote, but I played it like this. It's on a recording I did with. Um,
this part I remember. It's a very short piece, but so yeah. putting in some uh, jazz harmony into you know uh, traditional Irish tunes and even. Well, uh, songs that we know as a Mountains of Morn, that's just, uh, you know, that type of thing, uh, I, I certainly do a lot of just uh, for my own amusement. And what was the group that, with the Celtic connection? The Celtic uh, Lewis Nash, the drummer, uh, first call jazz drummer approached me about doing, um, you know, we did a whole album of traditional, we did uh, Drowsy Maggie, Peter Washington's on bass, Paddy Keenan on Lillian Pipes, and Niall Vallely, but I was thinking the same modes as Miles Davis explored are, you know, you have a... Uh, so we, we had Larry Willis comping like Mackay Tyner would, except behind the Irish reels. Another thing I remember doing was changing the rhythm slightly to accommodate one of O'Carolan's uh, and Lewis did the whole Cayley band drumming the rap the dancer without being too And after we came out of that we came and ba ba da ba da ba da 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 ba da 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 jazz waltz. I'm really interested to hear, did you already know those tunes from before or did you learn them for that gig? Um, that right. tune I knew. Um, the Orida stuff I knew from, actually I'm glad you asked me that because um, when I was a kid going to the Gale Talk, um, uh, I hated it, all sorts of authority and I remember every Sunday they'd march us to the church and this beautiful music was being played, sung in Gale and it was it was uh, Sean O'Reilly's Mass. Um, we were a bunch of Gurriers from Dublin and, you know, about 115, 120 kids from Dublin. I just remember one day we were left unsupervised in the choir gallery and the collection plate came up and it had less on it going down than it did when it came up to where we were. Not that I had anything to do with that, you know. Mm -hmm. It was the third week of our vacation. I'm sure Jesus would have contributed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hugh said, David was always incredibly generous and supportive to me on my many trips to New York. He was my New York landlord and was very generous setting up sit-ins and gigs for me. Not everyone would be that supportive, so. Well, he's one of my closest friends and it was, uh, thank you, Hugh, um, right back at you too. There's, um, we had, we had a lot of kind of shared experiences. And uh, the other thing was I had a teaching job that took me, uh, sometimes when Hugh would come over, uh, we'd have to make an appointment to meet one another or meet somewhere at, at a late night jam session. Because he was off, he was great at making his own connections. He became friends with Peter Bernstein and James Williams. And, you know, he found his own path. And sometimes I'd arrive home and he was passed out <laughs> on the sofa, or I'd be passed out. but. Uh, it was always great when he or Bernard Brady, a non-musician friend, that would come over and visit. Uh, another question in from A.B. Khan. Any advice for jazz singers just starting out? Jazz singers just starting out is, um, you know, that's a kind of a loaded question. Is, is there any advice to this? Um, if you feel this music and you love it, uh, you have every right to sing it and be out there doing it. 
Um, I think sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of times you're going to face um, singers can be treated like the whipping post by musicians at times. You know, you're expected to know right from the start that you, you should know every key you sing every song in and, and maybe a little kindness from musicians. Uh, I would appeal to uh, musicians to show singers that are coming up first and and then on the other end of it, uh, don't come out too cocky acting like, uh, you know, that the musicians are your, uh, your uh, set design on stage. They're, they're providing how they interact with you musically. You know, they deserve your respect just as you deserve theirs. That, that would be kind of probably the best thing I would say. Mm. I know it doesn't tell you how to get into it and all that, but just try and um, find out what it is you want to sing. If you like standards, if you're like a particular approach that some other singer has, uh, imitate as many different uh, ways of doing it that you hear on the path to finding your own thing. Yeah, sounds like great advice. And uh, Khan asked, what's the story with the banjo on the wall? So the banjo on the wall is, um, that was actually, uh, uh, I bought that from my son who was uh, playing, I wanted it too, but he was, uh, I love traditional music, by the way, but my son is, um, he's a soccer player now. He gave up all music after I got him the banjo and became a soccer player. So I'm not sure if there is a connection, but, uh, you know, he, he, he doesn't, music is not his passion right now. And so it, I'm afraid it hangs there a little bit, but I, um, I might take it down. There's a few things hanging here that don't get played like they should. <laughs> We've uh, got, got about 10 minutes left and we were talking about picking techniques the other day and I'd love to to hear you explain that again. It's really interesting for a lot of guitar play players are listening now. So what are you what are you up to with the picking? Um, initially, I would have probably been trying to just try and play as fast as I could and as furiously. And really what the pick is, it's kind of if you're playing a, a wind instrument, it's your lungs, it's your... You know, it's your means of making a sound if you're playing with a pick. And I noticed that a lot of straight ahead jazz guitar players would play single note solos and sometimes um, nothing at all if they're playing with guitar, bass and drums, just single notes and go, you know, while well, the bit And then guys who were influenced by Wes would play play a couple of chords as octaves and then they do you know some chords of but I noticed piano players don't do that piano players uh, will play a single note line that culminates sometimes in a chord or chords so they'll uh, they might be say improvising over something that um To execute, I'm, I could have done a bit better with that one, but uh, it's just trying to get warmed up here. What I, um, what I felt was the pick should not dictate anything to you about what you're going to play. So if I learned how to play a line that started on the downstroke, I was completely screwed if I tried to play that line I started it on the upstroke. So straight away, one quick fix is to practice both ways. And then after a while, I began to kind of think that you hear string players playing long tones with their bow. And you also have, um, uh, 
wind players playing, you know, the, the zen of playing. So I began to think it doesn't have to be fast to, you know, a tremolo would be, or you can go asleep doing it almost, going, your mind wandering. But what if you then start to do, drummers do that, but drummers have all these, so many sticking patterns. And I remember buying one book that had them grouped in fives and sevens, and the odd number would be a repeat stroke. So the drum stroke was, you know, your right hand, left hand, right, left, right, left, paradiddles, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. That was down, up, down, down, up, down, up, up. And you can expand this exercise out so many. You can do single notes with it where you go. So down, up, down, down, up, down, up, up. What about if you go, the first one in each group is a chord. And that prepares you for... Um, from single note to to chord to you know without having to go to a, a major kind of oh god how do I do this uh, so very simply there's a world of you know a group of five for example if you're going to do that uh, with with two down two down strokes to begin with and then alternate down down up down up then move the two, uh, start out with down, up, up, down, up. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting idea. I haven't heard anybody else talk about that, picking like that. I think that's, that's really interesting. I'll have to look, at, look into that, try that out. You know, what I like about it is it slows me down so much. And then when you get out and play, you're like, the most natural thing to do is to, um, is to alternate strokes when you're trying to play fast with pick notes but what i did notice after a while was when i'm on a gig i remember noticing i was doing crazy stuff with the right hand like it was it was making its own decisions based upon the sound i was hearing and so i think after a long period of trying out these different things uh intuition takes over maybe so uh, just a few minutes left. I'm going to put a link in the chat box there to a PayPal, which is David's friend's PayPal address, because David's PayPal is not working at the moment. So if you learn something there, I'm sure you learned something. If you have any money and you want to send some over to David for that, that's very appreciated. Even a euro or a dollar or five or ten, doesn't matter how much it is. This is part of the reason why we're doing Guitar Night Live is because of the really catastrophic cancellation of so much work for so many guitar players. It's like, you know, really unknown about the whole rest of the year, really. It's, uh, it's bad. So if anybody wants to, please use this link here and put it in the chat box. I think you should still donate whether you want to or not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if anybody uses Apple Cash as well. You could use that one if you have that app. You uh, can use David's email, which I'll put in there. Or if not, just email him and say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, euros. But anyway, I'll ask David to play us a tune to finish out. And uh, as he's playing, I'll put in a link as well to our website if anyone's interested in looking at what classes we're offering, live stream guitar classes for beginners and up to intermediate and advanced players as well. So that's going to finish out Guitar Night Live for tonight. Really, thank you so much. Learned so much there. It's really a pleasure having you, David. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, what tune would you like to play? Um, what's the name of this one? Uh, I can't remember the name of it now, and I, I can remember the tune that I just thought of. Uh, I'll tell you what, I play, this is, this is a good one to play right after you've just given an appeal for money. It's called The Best Things in Life Are Free. <laughs>
always just one lonely clap at the end. It's the <laughs> you can't hear the sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> Look at the harp harmonics at the end. Beautiful. Check out Lenny, bro. That's where I stole his <laughs> his his thing. Uh, we did. We missed hearing lots of stories. I knew it would have been good. We'll have to have you back another time. And uh, also, I should say, if if anyone wants to get a lesson with you, can they email you and arrange a lesson? Sure. Um, we can. I can do it via Zoom. I think is probably the the way to go. And um, if uh, use that same email address, I can I can set up a lesson. Um, Great. So anybody, grab those uh, details and the David's email address is there, and just. Save those when I end the meeting now that will disappear. So uh, grab those before it goes. Also join us next week, Jimmy Smith's on. Do you know Jimmy Smith? Oh Jimmy, all right. Yeah. That'll be fun when Jimmy is um, a man with many strings to his bow. So yeah. you'll have fun with that. Very <laughs> talented man. Brilliant. Thank you all for listening. Better get let you get going and setting up your own thing now, because you're straight over to another live stream. So hope you guys join us next week. See a lot of you during the week. Uh, a request for all of me, but uh, I think we're out of time for another. I can do a quick one if somebody needs. Um, I see yeah. I see somebody said, uh, which Andy was that, by the way, wanted, uh, he wanted, said 10 euros for what, oh. what happens. Uh, <laughs> is he a Dublin guy, is he? Uh, I'm not sure which Andy that is. Is that Andy McDonough from Arizona? Could be, yeah. could be. Actually, also, uh, twice, yes, it is. It is Andy McDonough. Um, all of me. Um, and Neil Lazar is requesting all of me. All of me. Okay, <laughs> that's that's a new joke. I play that with him each week. Uh, I'll even. Is that a relation of Janie uh, Lazar? Uh, Neil Neil has a fabulous guitar collection. You would drool. Yeah. <laughs>
Brilliant. There you go. Brilliant. Well, have you no homes to go to? <laughs> we'll have to try and have another jam, Kazam jam. What's that? Yeah, we will. Um, yeah, we'll do that because uh, apparently, you know, we were getting close there. Yeah, it'd be cool if we can eventually set it up through Zoom as well so you can play. Yeah. And um, each other. That'd be cool. You know, you'd make a fortune doing that. You could say, uh, for 10 euros, I can promise you, you won't have to play with David. You <laughs> won't have to play with Daniel. So if you want to play, not have to play with us, it's going to cost you money. But to play with us is, is for free. <laughs> Great business idea. Okay, well, uh, say good night this afternoon for you, but we'll, uh, we'll head off. Thanks, everyone, for coming again. Thank you, David. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. And uh, head over to David's Facebook if you want to watch the... The Daily Blast there with the guests. We're coming up with Scott Flanagan now. I've got to sign them in now, I think. Uh, cool. so, thank you so much. I'll hit the leave meeting here. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for listening in. See you, David. Bye-bye.